Hey guys, what's up? It's me, MC Matador here, and today I am bringing you part three of my top 25 amusement parks I have visited. I will say that, I know, it's it's obviously the new year. It's my second video of the new year, and I'm just doing part three of this series. And I, was, I think I said I was going to try and get it done before the new year. Or did I say February? I don't know. Yeah, I'm probably going to miss that deadline too. It's already the mid-month. Um, I'm back at university now, so I'm just starting my second semester. Uh, it's definitely going to be a wild one, so I'm not sure if that's going to intervene in my videos, or uh, it most certainly will, I just don't know how. And let's get right into it. Number 15 is Kentucky Kingdom in Louisville, Kentucky, with a whopping five coasters that I rode when I visited the park just this past August 2019. Or sorry, it was July. Uh, so that trip kind of went from July to August. It was in July of 2019. And... I want to say, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure the last entry before from last part was St. Louis, which I had some serious critics for, but from here on out, I really don't have anything but nice things and nitpicks to say about a lot of the parks that are coming up. Can, can, uh, Kentucky Kingdom was honestly a fantastic, charming, and compact park, and with a very rich history. Uh, Kentucky Kingdom is a very tumultuous, troubled park that's been around on and off since the late 80s, and the fact that it's even still around today, or at least has been revived, was a miracle in the first place. Uh, I, I mean, I think that there are some knocks of this thing, but when you have a fantastic one-two punch like Lightning Run and Storm Chaser, by the way, both of which are in my top 15, you really have a solid lineup. I mean, obviously it is, uh, there's some knocks of this park is that it's very constricted with its size and its setting. Uh, it, it really limits itself. It doesn't have a lot of room to expand, and they already have a very convoluted layout because they're in the middle of metropolitan Louisville, Kentucky, right next to the airport, basically, uh, just off of a road. Like, you can see the, the city all around you, and it really can't expand that far. It's so, it really prevents it from being a major U.S. park. It just ends up being more of a small park, uh, kind of fan local family feel type of thing. This is remedied, though, by the classic, famous Tri-Park Ohio River Tour, where people, because the parks are within like three or four hours of each other, all three of them go to Holiday World, Kentucky Kingdom, and Kings Island, all along the Ohio River in the same trip. Like, these, these parks are ridiculously close together. There's no reason, like, if you're doing a road trip, there's no reason to do one when you can do all three. I have no reason not to visit this park, especially... Or there's no reason to not visit this park, especially as a coaster enthusiast. And I'm also well aware that they do plenty of things for coaster enthusiasts as well. They have exclusive events, it's very affordable to locals and coaster enthusiasts traveling from afar. The legendary Ed Hart, who is quite the character, and I'd love to meet him eventually. Oh, and the social media team, their Twitter is spicy. Just the amount of hot takes they do about their competition, as well as self-promotion in, in the strangest, most internet humor style way. No, it's not deep fried, sadly. I don't know if I'd want that. I don't know if the world's ready for that. I love Kentucky Kingdom with my with all my heart, and I would love to visit it once a year from Chicago if I could. Like, just once in the summer, get a hotel, just really close to the area, take the shuttle, and just take advantage of, like, the, what, the $40 ticket for non-Kentucky natives, that, and also get free refillable soda, or unlimited free soda for buying that ticket and they get a second day if i want to it is an absolute slam dunk and the park wasn't even wasn't very busy i went on a saturday i believe i went on a saturday in july and i never had to wait more than 20 minutes for a coaster um i think my longest wait might even have been t3 because it was only running one train it was absurd if the park's not that busy consistently but it stays open i would love to give it more business I love Kentucky Kingdom. I just, obviously, I'm going to get to a theory later, because you'll see why it's number 15. It only does so well, but you'll see from here on out that I have nothing but nice things to say about a lot of these parks. I do wish that uh, they were a little more generous with the King Louie interactions, though, because supposedly, you know, he's kind of the face of what brought the, the history of the park back in as a major marketing tool, and, well, they I don't even know what the fuck happened there. Uh, sorry for the swears, I'm trying, if I drop a swear every now and then, I can make, I can not get sued by Copa, so don't mind me on that. Uh, Holiday World, number 14 in Santa Claus, Indiana. I want to say that choosing between Kentucky Kingdom and Holiday World is extremely difficult. 
even if you were going into them blind, the, the geographical distance from Chicago is, like, ridiculous. You could get, even though Kentucky Kingdom is further away geographically, it's right off the, it's off the major interstate, which saves you time. Going to Holiday World takes about the same amount of time, despite it being closer, because you have to take the state roads instead of the interstates. That There's no interstate that runs through directly through Santa Claus. Both parks are token, small, Midwestern amusement parks. They heavily compete with each other. They both cater to the public and coaster enthusiasts more so than any other park, or most other parks. And they both have really sizable dry parks and water parks. They directly compete with each other. They're really close to each other, like probably not even two hours from apart. But in the end, Holiday World will win, will win for me by a slim margin. Like, this thing was very close to being number 15, but instead it beats out Kentucky Kingdom and gets number 14. The benefits just for going to the park is absurd. If you, even if you don't ride anything, you it's pretty cheap tickets. You get free parking, which is a pretty sizable lot. You get free soda, Pepsi products, unlimited free soda, unlimited free sunscreen. Not like you're going to use more than what you need to cover your body a couple times if you're staying there all day. And the lockers, the food, especially since I had to use a locker for the water park... Like, three people's stuff fit in one locker, and it was $10 for the whole day. That's not bad. I think, really, my major conflict for this park comes from the coaster lineup, which is, for a coaster enthusiast, is one of the most important parts to drive a reason to go to a park. If a park doesn't have a good lineup, there's not, and if it's, especially it's out of the way, uh, off the major beaten path, as Holiday World is, it wouldn't have a reason to go. Of course, the coasters there are still good. Voyage, Thunderbird, Legend, and Raven are all all solid rides. I mean, one's good, one's overrated, one's underrated, and then you have the best waiting coaster in America by a slim margin. Because waiting coasters can only be so good. And they never really break through because they're waiting coasters. And I'll let you figure out what the categories for good, overrated, and underrated are. It doesn't have the diversity of Kentucky Kingdom's lineup. The lineup is very lopsided to wooden coasters and then just a random steel coaster because that was the first one they built. And they have three water coasters, so they can flex on people by have, saying, hey, we have three water coasters. And I have yet to reveal my 2019 list standings, but I'll tell you that Kentucky Kingdom definitely had a run for this thing because Storm Chaser and Lightning Run combined are better than Hollywood, Holiday World's entire lineup. If you don't look at the coasters and look more at the ambiance, Holiday World puts a lot more attention into landscaping, theming, character interactions, and entertainment, making Kentucky Kingdom feel pretty bare bones. It almost feels like a Six Flags park to Holiday World feeling like a Bush Gardens park. Maybe not that drastic, but Holiday World put, cares a lot about the stuff regarding ambiance and just the smaller things, and it really gives Holiday World a slight edge in my book. Uh, it's just Holiday World also has Hollywood Nights, which I've heard is an absolutely fantastic event that I really want to do when I maybe get in my 20s. I don't have the means to do it right now, and I'm not sure if I want to try and compete with that, but I really want to try a Hollywood night at one point. So I'll definitely tell you if I'm going to do it. It might be a while. I don't even know if my channel will be a thing at that point, but that's not the conversation right now, is it? Number 13 is Six Lives New England. Now... You might be wondering why I'm putting Six Flags New England, a middle-of-the-road Six Flags park with all the reputation attached to Six Flags as it does, over two legendary token Midwestern parks in Kentucky Kingdom and Holiday World. I like to think that this. I'm a sports fan, I like sports, and I like sports satire more than the next guy. And I like to relate the amusement park business to the salary cap, the non-existent salary cap of the MLB. You have things called the small market and the major market. The small market teams are like your Cincinnati Reds or Kansas City Royals. They, or maybe your Oakland A's because of the whole money ball thing. They can be smart, strategic, charismatic, and all efficient, and do all sorts of things to try and be competitive. But they just can't outgun the major market teams. The Yankees, the Cubs, the Red Sox, the Braves, if you want to go that way, the Cardinals, the Dodgers... Because they, just because those major market teams have more money, they have more land, they have more corporate support. And that really 
is the whole manager driving why a lot of these mid-major or even when you get to the later parts, major parks that may not do as much of these as these minor parks or mid-major parks in the terms of just general completion, but these major parks end up winning. It's because they can just afford them. They can afford the land. They can afford the corporate ties. They can afford to have more money pumped into them, and they already have been around long enough to where they have a long-standing lineup. Six Flags New England has 10 coasters. I've been on nine because Goliath keeps breaking down. I was last at this park in 2018, and I went to, I've been to this park twice, and I haven't been able to ride Goliath either time, but let's just say in my terms they have 10 coasters, nine of which I have ridden. I haven't heard good things about Goliath, so it's not a huge loss other than just for the credit, lol. This park is, I'm not going to try and use this analogy for the minor major markets, kind of like the Major League Baseball, uh, to knock Six Flags New England in any way. This actually is a still, a still really good park. It's got a pretty balanced lineup. It definitely needs a launch coaster to really complete it. It needs to get rid of some of their lemons, like Flashback, Gotham City Gauntlet, Riddler's Revenge, Goliath. Maybe not Riddler's Revenge, because I've heard some people like it, but definitely Gauntlet, Flashback, and or Goliath. They got some lemons to work on. But their one-two punch in Wicked Cyclone and Superman are just... It's its something to really go ahead and visit. It's one of the largest parks in the entire New England region, if not the largest park. Uh, I have family who lives in Boston, so bo going from Boston to Springfield is just just like a travel to the great America at my end. It's not really that much longer. So just... There's a lot of reason for me to go there so often. <sighs> And there are a few things. I want to say that I visited this park twice earlier. I want to say because of that, that I enjoyed my visit in 2016 more than my visit in 2018. Like, the, the, the magic of this park kind of soured when I went to my second visit. I mean, that's probably because Wicked Cyclone wasn't running as well. It was also a cloudy, cold summer day compared to a, a sunny, sweltering hot day the first time around. Uh, I had less people, I only went with one person instead of four, and, but it might have just been other things, but I feel like this park definitely was a little overhyped when I first went, and I'm really glad I got the revisit, or else this thing would probably be a lot higher. Unfortunately, a lot of parks cannot be subject to the second park, the second visit criticism, so this park probably stands alone, or pretty close to alone, when it comes to second visit criticisms and unfortunately this park soured as I visited it more and I'm wondering how a third visit would go. Really, I think the biggest park with this problem is it's lemons. They really only have two, three good rides. The rest just kind of stink. And even then, Superman isn't that great and Dar Batman the Dark Knight is just a generic small floorless coaster. Wicked Cyclone's really the only thing outstanding. And that's kind of what made this park kind of sour. I mean, they're both, I mean, of course, their top three are great rides, but really, other they kind of have Carowin Syndrome to where the rest of their lineup outside of their major three, or in this case, major, yeah, major three, more like major two and a supporting third wheel, just kind of stinks. Like, they're, they're bad. Goliath, Flashback, Gauntlet, Thunderbolt, Mind, or formerly Mind Eraser, now Riddler's Revenge are all, like, bottom 25, 20% coasters. Pandemonium and Joker don't fare much better. I don't know if they have a single coaster outside of their top three that breaks into my top 50%. It's kind of sad that they don't have that support. And they really aren't getting that much love from Six Flags. So, I wish you better, Six Flags New England, but I definitely want to say it's been an interesting place putting you here. That's my major critiques is your lemons. Fix them. Moving on, we have Knott's Berry Farm at number 12. When I went, there were eight coasters, which since then, that I went in that limbo period in 2017, after the Boysenberry Festival where Boomerang had been demolished and fencing was up, put around the area, which later became Hangtime, a Gerslauer Infinity Coaster. I have not ridden Hangtime, I have not ridden Boomerang, I got the least amount of possible credits from this park. Uh, so, yeah. This park definitely has to do everything it can to stand out, because SoCal is very competitive. 
You already saw Universal Studios in this list and doing what it does. You, I have not been to Disney Disneyland in Anaheim, but that also is a very popular area. I mean, it's obviously very popular because it's Disney. Uh, you'll see Magic Mountain later in a different in a different part. Spoiler alert: Magic Mountain is better than Knott's Berry Farm, but you'll see by how much. Uh, I think that Knott's Berry Farm has a really nice blend of coasters, flats, entertainment, and amenities, as well as some really charming parts for locals. The good reasons to keep coming back to this park several times annually. The Boysenberry Festival, and the Not Scary Farm, which is absolutely legendary among horror enthusiasts, which is not my cup of tea. I like watching that crap from the sidelines, but it's just because the, the, the art of making a haunted house fascinates me. But... That's not my cup of tea. Knott's Berry Farm has a lot of things going locally, but I'm going off just my experience as well as some of the things that have developed after my experience in terms of, you know, the permanence, as I like to call them. Like, hang time. The major problems with this park are, first, overcrowding. This place is nuts when it comes to people. I'm not sure if I can find any point in the season, especially if I well, that I'd be able to reasonably go, that is not absurdly busy i went on a monday a scorching hot monday in july it wasn't a holiday it was just a random ordinary monday and everything had over 30 minute waits except for like the obsolete stuff even ghost rider had 30 minute waits and forget ghost rider ghost rider was two hours all day long i could not catch a break with that so that was interesting. And Ghost Rider and Accelerator are their best rides. Of course, they have some really good supporting rides. Sierra Sidewinder is super underrated. Silver Bullet is a really solid addition. My old Monty is legendary for what it does. And then Jaguar, Pony Express, and Coast Rider I exist. And Hang Time was also really good, too, in their top four, if I were able to ride it. I think that their ops were not great either, especially for Accelerator. The accelerator ops were miserable. Like, they were dispatching trains every three to five minutes for a, tw a sub-30 second cycle. Accelerator's a great ride, but I was only able to ride it once because the cycle, the, the ops that they ran were miserable. Uh, they also suffer from the, the small market syndrome. Not because they're a small market area, but because they have not a lot of land to work with. They're really just kind of stuck. They have to work with what they have, and they really don't have much else other than what they got. They have to, they're in that stage where they have to remove something to, to build something. Like, they're removing Voice to the Iron Reef to put in their Knott's Berry Jam uh, shooting dark ride this, for this season. They renovated their River Rapids ride recently in 2019 to the Calico River Rapids. And those were just renovations. They haven't, and they had to remove two rides, a roller coaster and a top spin, to put in hang time. Like, everything going to Magic, going to Knott's Berry Farm comes at a cost. Magic Mountain has room to expand. For the, for, somewhat. So, yeah. Now, Knott's Berry Farm is an interesting little place. I would love to go back to it eventually. It's special since we're coming up on three years since I've been to anywhere in the Southwest. But, I mean... Definitely got to try and do... Maybe I got to try and get a more bit more fortunate visit. Because I do not want to wait two hours for Ghost Rider again. If possible. Number 11, the final part in this list, is Six Flags over Georgia. In Austell, Georgia. Just to the west of Atlanta. I haven't been to this park since 2015. I do remember it quite fondly. And it has really gotten a generous share of expansion since I've been there. This park was notorious when I went for being in the middle of a unnecessarily long coaster drought. From 2011 to 2018, seven years, they have not, they did not get a single coaster. And then they got Twisted Cyclone for 2018 and everything just kind of remedied itself. I was not able to ride Twisted Cyclone, I instead rode the uh, much less awesome Georgia Cyclone. Which, uh, kind of stinks. Like, it was bad. Really bad. The lineup is absolutely stellar. They have 10 coasters in their lineup, and they're all, for the most part, good. 
even Blue Hawk, which I can I can imagine Blue Hawk is kind of an underrated thing. It can be like I've heard Gasm is getting some work, so it's not going to be as awful as people making it sound to be. I liked Gasm, but I wrote it in 2015. Dalanaga is just your clunky old dine train that may or may not get bite the dust depending on Ace. But outside of that, they don't have a bad coaster. They got rid of their worst coaster in. Uh, they got rid of their worst coaster in Georgia Cyclone and they remedied the other two. To a, or are in, they remedied one or are in the process of retracking the other. Superman, Batman, Mindbender, Daredevil, Die, Georgia Scorcher, all fantastic supporting pieces. I just, unfortunately, my major reason to go to Atlanta has since ceased to exist. Not because, you know, something has ceased to exist, but because I used to have extended family. My uncle's, by marriage, brother lived north in the northern Atlanta suburbs. And he has since, uh, just as a couple years ago, moved to Austin, Texas. So if I need a place to stay with family, or at least to go see them, to justify going to over Georgia for fun, I don't have that reason anymore. And I don't know where Austin is in proximity to other family joints, but Texas is a lot harder to get to than Georgia for he, us here Chicagoans. Uh, just from the Midwest as a whole, unless you're like in Missouri. So, I really do wish Six Lives would invest a little more into here as well. Like, 2019 was pretty good that they got a giant discovery. In 2020, they're demolishing an old, pretty admittedly ugly theater to put into, uh, to put in a Zamperla Endeavor and Scrambler. I'm not sure where they're getting the Scrambler from, but they're getting a Scrambler, which is pretty good. They have a nice pocket of rides over there in Gotham City. Um, Goliath and Twisted Cyclone are an absolutely fantastic top two. I haven't been on Twisted Cyclone, but I've been on Goliath, and Goliath is awesome. I just wish that they would, like I said, invest more into here. I'd love to come back. Maybe with my newfound privileges, if I gather friends, if I go on spring break at university and maybe fly to Atlanta. Atlanta's a huge airport, so tickets won't cost that much. Um, especially if I go during a non-peak time. We'll see. I'd love to get here eventually, even if it's on my own dime. <sighs> I'd I, but that will wrap up my list. So, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave a like, comment, or subscription. If you, I hope you guys have a great insert unit of time here. For those who are in school, or go just starting school up again, or have been in school for like the second week, I hope you guys get to the semester, or the rest of the year, just fine. If not just fine, amazingly, everything's so awesome, things are flying everywhere. And, uh, as always, I hope you guys, or sorry, I wish you guys, peace.